Hi everybody, this is day number 11 and today's episode is brought to you by uh, the number E, which is of course 2.71828. Uh, you might be familiar with it from math, it's the basis of natural logarithms. Uh, it's called Euler's number and the cool thing about it, if you look at this function, y equals e to the x, it's the only function around okay, where uh, the slope at a certain point is the same as the area underneath at that same point. Uh, I'm not sure what good that does actually, uh, but it is pretty cool. Uh, if you take uh, some high level physics courses and you're studying waves uh, and various other topics, you will actually run into Euler's number uh, E in pretty common use. Uh, okay, uh, enough of that. What we're really interested in today is kinetic energy. And this video is going to be three parts. Uh, a bit of a general explanation about kinetic energy, uh, how to calculate it, and then an example. So the first part, a bit of a general explanation about kinetic energy. Uh, first of all, you have to realize that the definition of energy, the way physicists like to define it, it's the ability to do work. Now, uh, think about that for a second. Suppose you have uh, a can of gasoline. Well, obviously that gasoline has chemical energy and you can pour it inside your car and you can drive your car around and you'll, your car will exert a force over a distance. Or uh, think of a, a little battery. Obviously that battery uh, has some electrical energy and you can slide that little battery inside your drone and your drone can fly all over the place exerting a force over a distance. So physicists, they define energy as the ability to do work. And kinetic energy, well, that's energy due to motion. Pardon me, that is energy due to motion. And you can probably imagine that, you know, anything is moving, well, it can do some work for you. It can supply a force over a distance. Okay, uh, now, here's where it gets a little more mathematical. If you apply work to something, its kinetic energy is going to change. Makes sense, right? If you're going to apply a force over a distance to something, well, you're going to change its velocity. Its kinetic energy, its energy due to motion, is going to change. And if you look at the definition, energy is the ability to do work. The definition is basically saying that energy and work are equivalent. Okay? Energy and work are equivalent. That's a very important piece because if energy and work are equivalent, well, however much work you do on something, you're going to change its kinetic energy the same amount. Okay, However much work you do on something, you're going to change its kinetic energy the same amount. In other words, work is equal to change in kinetic energy. Uh, now, of course, how do you calculate kinetic energy? That's what We'll look at uh, in just a sec. All right, let's uh, take a look how to figure out kinetic energy. Uh, suppose we have a mass, and initially it's stationary, it's not moving, and we apply a force to that mass uh, over some distance or displacement for some length of time. So obviously, if you apply force to the mass, the mass is going to accelerate. So after you've been pushing on it uh, through some distance for some length of time, well, that mass is going to be over here. It's going to have some velocity. Uh, it's going to have kinetic energy. It's moving, therefore it has kinetic energy. The question is, how much kinetic energy does it have? How can we calculate that? Okay, well, uh, you got to remember, uh, that work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Okay? And that's what I have right here. Okay? It's flipped around a little bit, big deal. Work and change in kinetic energy, they're the same thing. Now, let's see what we can do with this. Well, change in kinetic energy. That's gonna be 
the final kinetic energy, Ke, which is what we're interested in, take away the initial kinetic energy. And of course, since it's stationary, the initial kinetic energy is zero. Now let's look at the other side of the equation. We got work there. Well, work is equal to the force, okay, times the distance. And we're calling the distance, uh, I guess what we should be calling it the delta x, it's, it's a displacement too. Uh, so that's where we're at now. Ke minus zero is equal to f delta x. Uh, let's see what we can do with this. Well, of course, Ke minus zero is just Ke. Uh, how about this force? Well, remember Newton's second law, the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So now, this is how we're looking. The kinetic energy is equal to the mass times the acceleration times the displacement. Okay, what can we do with this? Now here's where it gets really interesting. Take a look at the acceleration. Acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time. What's your change in velocity? Well, it's going to be final velocity, v, take away initial velocity, zero. So your change in velocity between here and here, v take away zero, well, that just comes out to v. Uh, and of course, the time interval, you can't do very much with that. So the acceleration is the same as the velocity divided by delta t. Uh, the acceleration is the same as the velocity divided by delta t. Now, what can we do with delta x? Okay, uh, look at this. Uh, remember, how far you go is equal to how fast you go multiplied by how long it takes to get there. Delta x is equal to v delta t. I'm sure most people are familiar with that one. Actually, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that one. And, and remember, velocity is changing. It starts out stationary and it's accelerating, so velocity is changing. So in this handy dandy little equation, you got to use the average velocity. So the displacement is equal to the average velocity multiplied by the time. What's the average velocity? Well, you add your two velocities up and you divide by how many there are. Well, zero plus V is just V and then you divide by two. So there's your average velocity multiplied by your time. So your displacement, v over 2, multiplied by the time. Displacement, v over 2, multiplied by the time. So this equation, it becomes this. Uh, nothing happens with the ke and the m. The a is the same as that. The delta x is the same as that. And we can do a little bit of canceling here. I believe, yeah, uh, this delta t, it's going to annihilate that delta t off the face of the earth. And what are you left with? Okay, well, I'm pretty sure uh, that what I have here, everyone will agree that this thing that I have here is exactly what I have here. I have mass times the velocity squared divided by 2 or multiplied by 1 half. So there's how you figure out kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. Reserve a few brain cells for that one. Uh, and one thing about kinetic energy, uh, kinetic energy is a scalar. Just like work, just like power, you'll never add kinetic energy on a vector Diagram. Kinetic energy is actually a really well-behaved scalar because, uh, let's face it, take a look at it. Kinetic energy can never be negative. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half times the mass times the velocity squared. Well, uh, the universe I live in anyway, uh, mass is always positive. Uh, velocity, it can be negative, but when you square it, it's going to be positive. So yeah, kinetic energy, it's actually a really well-behaved scalar. Uh, it's always positive, it is negative, pardon me, it is never negative. Uh, what we'll do next is uh, a little example and show you how you can uh, figure a few things out using kinetic energy. All right, here's a good example. Uh, let's see if we can estimate the horizontal force a catcher exerts on a ball thrown by an MLB, that's a, a Major League Baseball pitcher. 
Okay, so again, first thing to do, get a diagram going on here. So here's the ball. Uh, what's the mass of a baseball? It's about the size of an apple. Uh, I'm gonna say 100 grams, 0.1 kilograms. You can Google that and check my accuracy if you like, but it's just an estimate. So for our purposes, close enough. Now, when a Major League Baseball pitcher throws it, uh, what's the velocity of the ball? And it's going pretty close to horizontal. What is the velocity of the ball? Well, you can Google it, and on Major League Baseball players, uh, the best pitchers, they can throw a ball upwards of 90 miles an hour. So for the sake of round numbers, let's say they throw a ball at 100 miles per hour. Okay? Now, what's that in meters per second? Well, you can Google the conversion factor if you like. Uh, one mile is equal to 1.6 kilometers. Or you can look at your car speedometer and hopefully you're looking at your car speedometer over at the 100 mile an hour end, uh, just out of curiosity, just because you're not driving that fast. And if you look at your car speedometer, you can see that uh, 100 miles an hour is about equivalent to 160 kilometers an hour. And let's convert that to meters per second. So 160 kilometers, multiply that by a thousand to get meters, okay? uh, and then divide by 60 to get it into meters per minute, and then divide by 60 again to get meters per second. Uh, you do that conversion, and you get, I think, 44.44 uh, .44 meters per second. It's just an estimate, we'll round it off, to 40 meters per second. So our ball is approaching the catcher's mitt at 40 meters per second. Okay, what happens when it hits the catcher's mitt? Okay. Well, the ball comes along and it hits the catcher's mitt and obviously the catcher's mitt is exerting a force on it that's opposing its motion. And of course that's what we're trying to figure out just how big that force is. Now the question is, over how much distance does that force act? Okay. Uh, obviously, not a lot of distance about, let's see, that much. The ball contacts there and it's stopped there. So it's not a lot of distance, just a few centimeters. Just for the sake of round numbers and because it's an estimate, we'll say that the distance this force is exerted over is, oh, we'll say 10 centimeters, which is 0.1 meters. And of course, after uh, that force has been exerted for 0.1 meters of distance, well, the ball is stopped. And you have to remember that we're looking for the horizontal force the catcher exerts. So you don't have to worry about the force of gravity acting on the ball or the normal force or the upwards force exerted by the glove, just the horizontal forces. Now, one way to do this, okay, you don't have to know anything about kinetic energy to do this. You, you can do this as is. One way to do this is you could say, okay, uh, Oh yeah, I got it. You could say that okay, uh, the ball is going from 40 meters per second to a standstill in 0.1 meters of distance. And using one of those uh, fancy formulas, uh, delta x is equal to one half v delta t squared plus v1 delta t. Okay, uh, e you could figure out the uh, acceleration of the ball and then uh, you know the ball's mass, you know its acceleration. Well, you could also figure out uh, the force in the ball. But that's kind of long and complicated. It's a two-step process. Uh, we want to see if we can do it in one step. And here's how you can do it in one step. You've got a force being exerted over a distance. That says to me, work. And the ball is moving pretty fast here. It stopped here. That's a change in kinetic energy. The work done is equal to the change in 
kinetic energy. Okay? And you've seen that formula before when we introduced the concept of kinetic energy. Uh, well, one thing I didn't mention that in this equation, work equals delta Ke, the work done is the total work. Okay? And in this situation, uh, that's the only force acting. It's the total force. So uh, the work done by it is gonna be the total work. Okay, so let's work with this. Okay, work is equal to change in kinetic energy. So the work is gonna be the force times the distance. And again, you want total work. That means you need total force and we got total force. You know, that's the only horizontal force acting, so it's a total. And that's going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy, G, which is going to be the final kinetic energy. And over here, it's stopped, so that's going to be zero. Take away the initial kinetic energy, which is, of course, one half m v squared. Okay. Uh, now all you have to do is substitute in. So the force is what we're after. The distance is. 0.1 meters, uh, zero take away negative one half mv squared is going to be zero one half uh, m, which is what do we got here? 0.1 times the velocity squared, which is 40. And there you go, it's just a little bit. Uh, of algebra to figure this out. Uh, this is kind of handy. Uh, you got a point one here and a point one here, so they wipe each other off the face of the earth. And there is your answer. Uh, negative 40 squared divided by two, which comes out to, I believe, Forty squared is uh, sixteen hundred divided by two. Don't forget the negative sign. There's your answer. Negative eight hundred newtons. Uh, answer makes sense. That's a pretty large force, right? Eighty newtons. Pardon me, eight hundred newtons. That's like uh, the weight of an eighty kilogram mass. So that's a pretty large force, and yeah, I guess uh, that's why catchers wear gloves. Uh, as far as an assignment is concerned, I'll uh, put up a PDF of that and you can do the assignment. And the thing to remember when you're doing the, the assignment is whenever you have a force acting over a distance, think about this. The work done is equal to changing kinetic energy. A, uh, it's lots of times the easiest way to do that sort of a problem. All right, uh, good luck on the assignment. Tomorrow we will be talking about uh, gravitational potential energy, so make sure you finish the assignment on this for tomorrow. Uh, bye for now.